God is indeed good. He is indeed gracious. Our hearts are prone to wonder, but we can trust Him with them. I'm glad to see you here this morning. For those of you who have been attending recently, our focus has been on conflicts. That's always fun, isn't it? We dealt with the issue of the conflict of varying personal convictions and the conflict over theology, the conflict that people can have interpersonally and the conflict that when conflict becomes public. And so I would encourage you to do that. My intent was today to focus upon, I thought Mother's Day conflict, mm, I don't know. We, we probably shouldn't dig too deep there, but uh, um, was to deal with, all right, should the church have conflict with the culture that we're in? Can we be in the world and not of the world? Should, and again, more contemporary terminology, should the church engage in culture wars? And so when we begin to understand that, we begin to explore that, uh, we're going to take some time. But rather than just some broad sweeping principles, I want us to deal with some very specific things. As believers in the world, we have the truth of God who designed us and who created us, who instructs us and guides us. And then on the other hand, we have the culture of the world. And by the way, it's not new, the challenges that we face in the culture of the world. And I want to begin with our focus on the family. And just to kind of lay out some things, today is Mother's Day, and I wish to extend my best wishes and warmest congratulations and deepest honor and respect to the moms that are here. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I've already texted my mom and told her Happy Mother's Day this morning. She is at her church. She has some of my siblings there that are there with her. And, of course, Suzanne, the mother of my children, is here. And uh, I pray that it is a great day for you. We will deal with some of the issues, but our focus this morning is on wives and mothers, women. Now, does our culture have much to say about women today? Oh, oh yes, it does. Is the family itself under attack, or does it seem to be under attack? The first thing I would like to say, and I would encourage you to take notes on your outline if you've got your pieces of paper with you, the first sentence is God, our Creator, who knows us best, who made us, who knows everything about us, God, our Creator, has a divine design, godly design for healthy families. Families the way he designed them to be. Families the way that brings peace and contentment. Families that are healthy. And I would say, and the scripture says, that these are under attack. And some of you might say, well, that's an overreaction. We live in the United States of America. We have the freedom to live pretty much how we choose. No one's really attacking your family. Well, yes, they are biblically. And they have been since Genesis. As a matter of fact, just to mention a few things about the conflict in the family. You guys remember Adam and Eve were in fellowship with one another, right relationship, and then fellowship with God until they sinned and they rebelled against God. And then in Genesis chapter 3, you have God confronting them. Of course, he finds them. That, you know, they're hiding. He calls them out. He goes to Adam, and the first thing Adam says, well, you know, it's that woman that you gave me. And then, of course, Eve blames the ser serpent. And God pronounces a, a curse, if you will. And speaking to the woman specifically, in Genesis chapter 3, 16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And I heard one person say, and children have been a pain ever since. I'm, <laughs> I don't think that's the intent. Yeah, I try to be. But I will multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain shall you bring forth children. And then the next statement, your desire, in some translations it says shall be for your husband. In some translations it says shall be to rule your husband. This translation says shall be contrary to to your husband. The wife will try to dominate her husband, but he shall rule over you. The husband will inappropriately dominate his wife, or as we saw in the case of Adam, he'll be completely passive and blame shift and not take responsibility. That word to, to his desire shall be far, shall be contrary to, is the same word that is used in the very next chapter. If you remember Cain and Abel, you remember the story of Cain and Abel? These are Adam and Eve's two sons. They got, brought offerings to God. Abel brought one that God approved of, and Cain brought one that he did not. And Cain was angry and upset about this, and the Lord sp spoke a warning to Cain in Genesis 4, 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will it not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin 
is crouching at the door, its desire is contrary to you, is to dominate you. Exactly the same word, but you must rule over it. So we have this kind of battle of the sexes, if you will. The conflict began in Genesis chapter 3, but it's really continued to escalate all the way through the book of Genesis and all the way through history. Do you believe me when I tell you that it's difficult for families to follow God's divine design? I mean, we can pretty easily affirm that. In chapter 4 and verse 23, you have the first case of polygamy, one man, multiple wives. And God's original intention of one man and one woman for life was violated. And polygamy became a common thing, as we know throughout the Old Testament times. And it's still practiced in some places. And in chapter 9, you have the first lustful look, pornography, you could say. It corrupts the purity of single-minded devotion. Chapter 16, you have the first case of adultery. Chapter 19, you have the entrance and the first record, record of homosexuality with its perverseness. You have, in chapter 34, rape and fornication. In chapter 38, you have the first case of incest recorded. In chapter 38, 24, the first prostitute, the first woman to sell her body. In chapter 39, the first specific incident is recorded of a seduction. And so before you get out of Genesis... The family is under attack. No wonder marriages and families face such terrible conflicts. In our culture, these things are lifted up as normal and appropriate and even applauded. We are exposed to polygamy, evil thoughts, vile words, adultery, homosexuality, fornication, incest, prostitution, and seduction. Continually, and it's applauded on the TV, and it's applauded in the movies, it's applauded in the books that we read. We see it everywhere. And you can say, well, what chance does a healthy marriage or does a healthy family have? I want to tell you that Paul wrote this text, the Holy Spirit through Paul wrote this text in a culture that was very similar to ours. In the Roman culture, yes, they saw a man as the head of his family, but they went through all of the same things that we're having. There were all of these very same things, the polygamy, the adultery, the, the sexual sins of multiple kind, the influences that were detrimental to a healthy relationship between a man and his wife were equally there. And so here's the question, if we're under attack, is this a battle? And the answer is yes, but I have good news for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'd love for us to find this passage and read it together, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 starting in verse 3, and we will read down through verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3, reading through verse 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we're just humans, folks, with all the limitations that our humanity imposes upon us. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. There is definitely a war. There is definitely a battle, but it's not fought physically in our flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. We don't fight this battle with our human wisdom or our human cleverness. It can't be won that way. But we have divine power, supernatural weapons, God's power, able to destroy strongholds. Now, you have to carry, if I may borrow, we're still reading, but you have to carry, if I may borrow Paul's expression for it, you have to carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If we are going to engage in the destruction of fortresses, Paul depicts our enemy as very strong and fortified. We're fighting against a ford formidable foe. That's hard to say. We're fighting against a strong enemy. How about that? There, there, there's something that we have to face. We destroy, what do we destroy? Arguments. This is ideology. This is thinking. This is common accepted wisdom or the, or the thinking that pervades the age. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. Lofty opinion are from people who are, are assuming intelligence on their part. Uh, it is uh, those who um, are like characterized by proud human intellectualism. It's what's described in Romans 1 with the word professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. In reality, they are contrary to the word of God and foolish for being so, but in their own minds, they're intellectuals. So every lofty opinion that's raised against the knowledge of God, and he tells us, how do we do this? First of all, in ourselves, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so in destroying these ideologies, philosophies, the elements of proud human intellect that is raised up against the knowledge of God, that's where the battle, the culture wars, if you will, take place. 
what we're dealing with here is what people believe to be truth and what we believe and know to be truth. And so we're going to deal today. All this, by the way, is introduction, okay, because we haven't gotten to the text yet. But I want you to know where we're going because today we're going to talk about what the Bible says about being a wife and mom. And tomorrow we're going to look at the next passage in this same passage, Ephesians chapter 5, as Sharon read earlier, that deals with being a husband and a father. And then the next week, by the way, today's Mother's Day, wives and moms. Next week, men's retreat. Gear up, guys. Buckle down. It's got a lot to say to us. A lot of this lies at our door, the, the reason that we don't have healthier families than we do. And then children. Uh, graduation Sunday is going to be uh, Memorial Day weekend, the last Sunday of the month, and we're going to focus on, uh, on children. And the next week, we're going to talk about healthy families right at the end of Vacation Bible School, God's plan for the family. And the next week, we're going to talk about marriage and singleness. Isn't that great? And then we're going to spend the last two weeks in June, and we're going to focus on a lie that's being spread in the world and how we as Christians need to stand against one of, the, uh, one of the dangers that we're facing culturally that is the current war, and that's the issue of what the Bible has to say about sexual identity and gender identity and how that's to be lived out and how we can be used by God as a positive, healthy way of proclaiming the gospel, helping people uh, get in alignment with God's plan for them. Isn't that great? It's a, it's, this is a fun series. I'm excited about it. Um, but it is interesting to me that uh, we start with wives and moms. That's where Paul starts. And you have to understand that's radical in Paul's day. And in Paul's day, to start speaking to the women first uh, would have been countercultural to his day. What does our world say about uh, women? Uh, what about the feminist movement? Are you guys familiar with it? I looked up feminist movement online and it gave me 14 different options of different types of feminist ideologies. But a lot of people, I think, nowadays say, well, the feminist movement, that's kind of done. You know, we can affirm we want equal, equal pay for equal work, right? You can affirm that, right? Don't let me put you to sleep this early. Matter of fact, I, may, I, I will tell you, they turned the air conditioner on up here, and um, it got cold, but now it's not cold anymore. And so feminism... We believe simply means equal pay for equal work. We can affirm that, right? Feminism means that we need to do away with non-biblical stereotypes, correct? Where we impose our traditions and cultures on people of different cultures and traditions that have nothing to do with biblical truth, right? Very good. But here's the problem with that. Feminism is much deeper than that, has been historically much deeper than that, was even begun much more difficult than that. There's a deeper ideology and agenda that is being followed that is actually an attack upon God and upon the family structure that he instituted. You guys ever heard of Gloria Steinem? She said, I hope we will raise our children to believe in human potential, not God. Not God. Satan ideology can't ever just stop with social issues. They always move to theological ones. Sheila Cronin said, since marriage constitutes slavery for women... It is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking the institution of marriage. Freedom for women cannot be won until marriage is abolished. As far back as 1971, there was a feminist document called the Declaration of Feminism that says the end of the institution of marriage is a necessary condition for the liberation of women. And I could go down this list. As a matter of fact, I've got quite a list of quotes. But do you understand that there is an ideology here that is opposed to God and God's design? for human flourishing, for families. The reason that we have to take these ideas seriously is because they're the fortress, that that one of the fortresses that we fight against. They constitute the speculations and ideologies, the intellectualism that is erected against the truth of God. And they have a massive influence on education. Why can't we just say, we believe this, you believe what you want to, and it doesn't matter? It's because when these philosophies reign, when they rule, and I'm I'm losing this thing, Doc. I don't know what the matter with it is, but it is flopping all over the place and about to drive me nuts. Will, 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 somebody got some chewing gum? <laughs> I, I'm kidding. I will, uh, will, will manage, all right? I, I don't know what I've done or haven't done. Um, and this may be a means of slowing me down. People say I tend to talk fast. Listen, here's what happens. When these philosophies emerge and engage, 
They're put into governmental, legal, and educational policies. They're books that are being taught and written and taught. They influence law. They take away safe spaces. They influence culture a lot of different ways. They're influencing the courts and decisions that are made. They have a massive influence on education, universities that train teachers, that train children. Laws that are enacted are changed and prosecution of biblical values when we live into those biblical values, even workplace policies. And it becomes what is commonly accepted and the norm. And we need to know truth and believe it. Amen? Are you with me? We need to know truth and believe it. We need to know truth and stand on it. We need to know truth and communicate it. We have a role to play in our society. Today we celebrate Mother's Day. And it's a wonderful time to celebrate your mother or motherhood. For others, it's a difficult day. Years ago, one lady told me she never went to church on Mother's Day. She missed every year. I was her pastor seven years. She never went to church on Mother's Day because of the guilt she felt and continues to feel as a mom. Many women struggle with motherhood. They look great on social media. But behind the beautiful pictures, you don't see the frustrations, failures, fatigue that characterize the heavy responsibility that they face through the day. In the same congregation I was talking about, there was a young mother who had lost her child to an illness. I sat with her, and she wept and described to me how hard it was to be a mother who didn't have a child. Others have desired to be mothers, but God has not blessed the womb. Others were still either abandoned or abused by their mothers, either their biological or foster or step or adoptive mother. There can be no doubt we live in a fallen world. And that the consequences of sin, ours and others, have profound and often tragic consequences. But I just want to remind everyone here today. You're part of a family. If you're Christ, you're part of a family. You have a loving, heavenly Father. You have the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. You belong to a family that is much bigger than just your nuclear family. You have the family of God. You have a church. Look around. You have family. People who want to invest their life in you. People you can invest your life in. And whatever your situation, whatever your sorrow, whatever your joy, you are not alone. You are loved. And frankly, Christ is sufficient for every hurt. He's sufficient for every pain. He's sufficient for every bit of fatigue and frustration. He's sufficient and pours out grace upon us. And wherever you are on this journey, God is the one who redeems, heals, restores, and empowers. Happy Mother's Day. And we need to be in prayer for families. We need to live in the tension of, un or living in the tension of uncertainty, unmet desires. But in our text, we clearly see the foundation for healthy families. Now, I want you to listen to me quickly. We read all the way from verse 15 of Galatians chapter 5 down to verse 24. And from verse 15 to 21, that's great. We love that part. But what we have there in context is the foundation for healthy families. What does he say? What is the foundation? First of all, you're to be filled with the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine where is the, wherein is excess or which is debauchery, but rather do what? Be filled with the Spirit of God. We're to be joyful. We're to be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our heart. We're to be thankful have an attitude of thanksgiving in your family in everything always giving thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and we're to be mutually submissive verse 21 submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ isn't that great we love that part and then you get to verse 24 but let's do this sentence first Let's get this, this sentence down. It's as important for us to, grit, uh, to get. The key to fruitfulness or even peace in a Christian home is a mutually submissive attitude, honoring one another, seeking the good and the best for one another. Mutual submission is crucial to achieving a healthy and peace-filled home. Now, as I said, Paul speaks to wives first, and so we will. And in verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And all of a sudden, the wind just kind of goes out of the room. <sighs> what? That sounds oppressive, doesn't it? Wives, submit to your husband. You mean I'm supposed to obey my husband? We need to understand the text in the passage. And let's look at it grammatically. As a matter of fact, did you know that in this verse, in the original language, the word submit's not there at all? 
And some of you are saying, oh, good. No, the teaching is there. Wives, be subject to your husbands. But it's used there grammatically in verse 21. Submit yourselves to one another. And then it goes right on. Wives, to your own husbands. And the voice that is written in is the passive voice. To be subject to is the carryover from verse 21, hupotasso, be submitting yourselves to one another in the reverence of Christ, wives to your own husbands. But also, this is a passive voice verb, which means you're voluntarily submitting. This is an attitude of the heart, and it is distinct from what we find in chapter 6, where it says, children, obey your parents. That's submission, correct? This, this is distinct from that. A wife is not treated as another child commanded to obey her husband. And note also the restriction here, her own husband. The kind of statement where she would say, he is mine and I am his. And I'm willingly subject to his headship in Christ. Christ, Paul's instruction is nothing like the almost caricature of the domineering husband who says, I'm the man of this house, you will do what I say. You don't see that here. You don't see this in this text. It is a willing respect of the role that God has assigned to the husband. And do not miss the phrase, as unto the Lord. Why should a woman be subject to her husband? Because she is subject to the Lord. Because she wants to be obedient to him. She wants to follow his design for the family. Yes, she's thinking of her husband, but she thinks of the Lord. The husband is not the end goal, but the Lord is. And the question that she asks in her relationship, just like men, come back next week, your turn's coming, is, is what I'm doing pleasing the Lord? Ultimately, God has designed this. Ultimately, he has a plan. And even when we don't, by the way, is submission hard for everybody? Have I put you to sleep already? Is submission hard for every quality with complementary roles and responsibility? One of the things that the world would like, and I'm just, world the flesh, the devil, okay? We're just gonna, I'm just going to call all of that the enemy. Are you with me? One of the things that is antithetical to God's design is he wants to remove distinction between men and women. And God has made us distinctly male and female. And he brings us together and he's designed for the family. You see it all the way from Genesis throughout Scripture. A man and a woman committed to himself. A loving husband who sacrifices himself and exalts and builds up and equips his wife. A wife who is his partner and his helper who completes him. Who is designed for relationship and gifted with particular characteristics. And together, it's a wonderful picture of what it means to be complete. And what it means to be whole. And that's not to say that if you are single, you cannot be complete. You cannot be whole. That is absolutely not true. God is sufficient for every circumstance and every situation. And he can fully complete you wherever you find yourself. But look at the design and the picture that is found throughout Scripture. And they are distinct, equal in value, equal in worth, equal in God's affection, equal in attention, equal in, 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 in the, the desire to accomplish purposes but complementary in roles and skills and abilities. And all of that to say, boys and girls are different. <laughs> and doesn't it seem ridiculous we have to say that nowadays? And yet we do. It's important. Husband and wife equally spiritual, equal in value. Wife willingly places herself under the headship of her husband to fulfill the purpose and design of marriage. And this is not some sort of cultural, hierarchical thing that was imposed by men through history. Paul takes us back to the created order in Genesis chapter 3. And you can go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and look that up. I'm going to need to skip ahead. I've got a lot more. But I want to mention just a couple of things really quick. Two last two points. We'll run through them quickly. The godly wife, according to God's design, the Christian wife, will make home her priority. And is that ever under attack in our world today? As a matter of fact, William Scarborough, a sociology doctor of the University of Illinois in Chicago, wrote a paper, published it, and he said, we have a problem with equality. The primary pillar of gender inequality in today's society is in the family. People have a bad attitude toward gender in the family. 
They believe that men have a role and women have a role and they are distinct and different. Can I tell you that the Bible firmly teaches that men and women have complementary roles? What a false picture the world paints of the family. There's a great temptation to identify with the emphasis that is prevalent in our culture today. Feminism calls women to abandon focusing on the home. They say that the home is a place of oppression and slavery. And they call homemakers simply cooks, cleaners, slaves, and baby makers. What a lie. What a false picture of the family. The beauty of God's design, the glory of being a mother and of being a godly wife is called oppression in the world. What other place can that come from but the father of lies? God glories in the woman who prioritizes her family, who prioritizes her husband and her home and her children. She is the crown jewel of the family. She is the blessing of blessings. She has been called the queen of the castle. And certainly we see her as the bow that fires the arrow of the next generation into the world in order to change the world. She's a world changer, and it is impossible to accurately describe the amount of influence godly wives and mothers have. I have multiple stories here. I'm not going to share them today, but I'm going to tell you, nobody has more power to shape culture in the world today than a godly family and a wife who loves her children and invests her life in them. Titus chapter 3, I'm sorry, Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 5 says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. It's important that you understand that the home needs to be a priority. Now, does that mean that you can't work? It obviously doesn't. It obviously doesn't. I've never known a time when women didn't work. Now, in our culture, in our society, 70% of women are in the workforce, and some have to. There are single moms who are filling the role of mom and dad and provider and doing everything that they can. Uh, as a matter of fact, historically, particularly in an agrarian society, the whole family was responsible for provision. You got up. You went out. Everybody worked, right? It's important. The issue is why. Why is it necessary? How can I live my life in such a way that my family continues to be a priority? And there was a cultural emphasis that said women need to be more in the workplace and less at home, whereas Scripture says, no, The priority needs to be home. It does not restrict you from being in the workplace. I want you to understand that. There's no restriction from being in the workplace. But I will tell you, we have a very pragmatic Gen Z generation. They said, yeah, we're going into the workplace. But we've seen how our parents worked and worked and worked and worked and were never home and were never there and always tired and always frustrated. And so we'll go to the workplace, but if you don't give us sufficient family time off, you don't give us sufficient flexible schedules, And you don't let me work from home where I can stay connected with my family and those things that matter the most. I'm willing to take less to do that, but I'm just going to leave you and go work for somebody who will. It's important that we kind of recognize this. Ultimately, there is a season where children need to be the focus of the family. Now, what about the woman who says, I am a gifted, strong, intelligent woman. And I want to use my gifts in, in the workplace, and I want to use it in culture, and I want to use it inside it. Am I restricted? And Scripture says very clearly, your first sphere of influence is in the home, but it's never, never limited to just the home. You guys remember Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman? Just listen. Godly women are strong women. There's a fallacy that says homemakers are weak women not willing to make their way in the world. Listen, for the godly woman, her husband trusts her, and she does him good. She works with her hands with joy. She benefits the home with business savvy knowledge, experience. She is strong physically because she's active. She is caring for the less fortunate. She prudently cares for her family's needs. She marries a respected man. She is known for her excellent ways. She is dignified and joyful and kind. She is not lazy and an idle homemaker. She is praised by her children and her husband. She fears the Lord 
and is blessed. And she gets out of her life what she has put into it. When, in verse 31 it says, Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Yes, there is a principle of sowing and reaping. You sacrifice and you invest in your family and you willingly submit to the Lord's design for family and home. And you get some reward now and you will get great reward then. God's design is perfect. Don't trade it in for a cheap substitute. And for the people who say this is just oppressive, when is Scripture, when has God ever done anything that wasn't for your best and your highest good? I don't like it. I understand. I understand. But I want you to know that when you begin to live in the truth of God's Word, empowered by God's Holy Spirit, He'll change your thinking, He'll change your mind. And all that joy and thankfulness and dependence upon him and peace and rest that comes in obedience, all of that becomes your experience. See, here's what we need to understand. Yes, God has a design for the family. Yes, it involves wives and moms. Yes, there are demands that need to be made and expectations that need to be met. And men, your time's coming, all right? Uh, you you got to understand, our list is longer. We have more accountability and more responsibility because of the expectation God has placed upon us in the role that he's given to us. And this is simply a submission to design that God may be glorified in us and through us and that we may be a testimony to a world who needs to know his truth. Here's the point. God loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to flourish in this life, abundant living. He wants you to flourish in the life to come, and that only comes... When you rest in obedience to the word that he's given to you and you walk in obedience to the plan that he's laid out. God loves you. He cares for you. Our closing song today is going to describe the deep, deep love that God has for us. And I want us to just kind of kind of rest in that truth and in that reality because I believe, frankly, and certainly in my experience, one of the greatest earthly pictures of the love of God is the love of a mother for her children. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that in your love for us, you have a design. You have a plan that you put into place. I thank you, Father, for the women that are so strong, that give their lives to you, that join their lives with others to be obedient to you in the structure that you have. And I pray that you'll make us to stand strong. Help us to understand the lies of the world, to discern them, to fight against them not to superimpose over some scriptural verses, some uh, stereotypes that we have, our cultural stereotypes, but, Father, the, the, the core truths, the foundational truths of Scripture, Father, knowing that you know best, we, we love you, we trust you, we pray for your grace and your peace, for the reality of the presence of, of your love expressed in our lives, and particularly today, I pray for the women here, whether they be wives yet, whether they be mothers yet, I pray, Father, just for a special outpouring of your grace and your love and appreciation, which, mother, which mothers so often miss or don't get as they should, and appreciation for the people that you have made them to be. It is in your name I pray. Amen.